pleasure again. Greetings all. I am State Senator James Sanders Jr. And aren't you tired of fuzzy thinking? And you, when you ask a straight question, you can't get a straight answer. You people forget beating around the bush. You're not even getting to the bush this day and age. Uh, not at this show. On this show, we, we really pride ourselves in clarity. In fact, the show is called Let's Be Clear. And we pride ourselves in clarity. And I have brought you some of the best people that money can buy. And we are going to discuss one of the toughest issues uh, in the world today. And that is the, uh, the situation in Afghanistan and America's role uh, there. Um, I'm trying to find the right words, and I guess those are the best that I can find. So I'm going to really spend more time listening in this show than speaking, because I really want to learn. I'm, I'm like you, audience, and we have brought in many different people, and we have brought in two award-winning writers who have military experience, let's be clear, so they actually know what they're talking about for a change, uh, unlike most writers. But, but there I go thinking again, gets me in trouble. Um, and we're going to start with Jeffrey Wilson, and we're going to allow him to give the, the 30 seconds of who he is and how he got to sit in the seat that he's sitting in currently. And then we'll go to... Uh, to, to Mayor Lindsay, Mayor Lindsay, oh, Sharon, Major, Major. There was a mayor named Lindsay. Uh, yeah. and, and we will go back, back back to you, Don. So without further ado, Mr. Wilson, thank you very much for being on the show. Uh, let's have your take at it, sir. First, who are you? Absolutely. Thank. First of all, Senator Sanders, thanks for having me. It's, a, it's an honor to be here. Mm -hmm. It's a Wish we were chatting about something a little more cheerful, obviously, than all that's going on. Um, my name is Jeff Wilson. I'm a Navy veteran. Uh, I've served in a lot of different capacities, but uh, for the majority of my career, I had the honor of serving as a combat surgeon with Naval Special Warfare, deploying with an mm -hmm. East Coast Base SEAL team, uh, which is sort of the lens through which I have my insight uh, into the Middle East and what goes on there. Um, I did that for 14 years. Uh, and during that time, I transitioned to uh, my, I guess, my first love, which is writing. And I now am part of the uh, Andrews and Wilson brand. Since Brian's not here, I can say I'm the better half of the Andrews and Wilson brand. Uh, hopefully he won't watch. Um, but we write military thrillers uh, that try to honor the men and women that we've served with over our careers. Brian is a Navy veteran as well. Uh, and so we stay geopolitically connected. Uh, I have been in Afghanistan. I served there. Um, both in the military and afterwards uh, as a consultant and a contractor um, with other areas of the Department of Defense. Uh, so certainly I have some emotional ties, like I know we all do, uh, to what's been going on there. Well, take a shot at it, sir. Um, how did we get into that conflict? How did the conflict go? How, we, how did we leave this conflict or, or did we, or have we left the conflict? Yeah, well, and I think it depends on how you define conflict to answer the last question. But I'll, I'll preface by saying that the lens through which I view this is, is uh, as I know we're all trying to be, uh, very apolitical. As a, you know, you were talking earlier before we came on about the idea of a military man, you follow orders, you do what, what you're asked to do, mm -hmm. you achieve the mission and the goals that you're assigned. Uh, and that's how I approached my service there. And it's also how I approach my evaluation of where we are and where we came from. Um, I think you'd be hard pressed if we can all remember where we were on 9-11. You'd be hard pressed to find very many people who were not in favor of going into Afghanistan and pursuing the people who uh, murdered our, our countrymen. Um, as with anything that's protracted as this has become, slowly but surely, uh, not only does resolve tend to wither, but interest tends to wane. And I think the uh, patriotic, you know, all of us together, political aisle aside, slowly starts to dissipate and we start to evaluate things through our political lens. I've worked very hard my whole life, my whole career, 
to not be that. I'm a relatively nonpartisan people person in general. Um, and so when I look at these things, I try to look at them as a military person uh, and now as a writer who looks at geopolitics. Um, the change in the mission was the problem for Afghanistan. I think everyone would agree with that. Mm -hmm. The mission of going after Al Qaeda who attacked us, routing them and making sure they don't have a safe haven from which to attack us again was a solid, clear mission we could all get behind. Mm -hmm. As that slowly mm -hmm. devolved into something, and I don't want to even define it. I'd be interested in hearing how you guys define mm -hmm. it, but it became more nebulous, didn't it? And as that happened, mm -hmm. that's when things started to creep in um, that became more political and that Afghanistan and Iraq and other counterterrorism operations started to be viewed through partisan political lenses. And that's so unhealthy. You know, um, one of the things that I like to think about when I, when I look at all the division in our country right now, I think that we need to remember that before anything else, we're Americans and how we felt on those, those days after 9-11. It's okay that we don't vote the same. It's okay that we don't have the exact same policy opinions. But if we can start from the basic premise that we're all on the same page as Americans, we can look at something like Afghanistan, both prospectively and in, in the rearview mirror, a little bit more clearly. I think we needed to be in Afghanistan. I think that the mission there was clear. I think as someone who worked in uh, covert operations quite a bit and worked with other areas of the government, um, there is a lot of things that went on that maybe aren't in the public view that meant we needed to stay there a little bit longer so that we could establish intelligence assets and networks in there that, you know, so that if we need to uh, attack these people again and prevent another attack on our country, keep our people safe, we could do that. But once it degraded to the point that it was no longer about America, it was time to come out. To me, it's not as much about that as much as the, you know, what has happened acutely. I think it's hard for me to separate myself from all of my opinions of what led up to 20 years up to the withdrawal. The way the withdrawal unfolded, the leaving Americans in, in country, um, not supporting our, our partners and our allies the way we should have because of artificial timelines. That's hard for me to separate from the rest of the conversation because it's so personal and emotional. I've I've lost friends there, uh, some of the closest brothers I'll ever have in my life. Uh, they left their blood on that battlefield in Afghanistan. And I've got friends and partners in Afghanistan, people that I worked with, Afghans that I worked with closely, uh, that I mm -hmm. consider to be brothers at nearly that same level. And I know some of them, one in particular that I can't get in touch with may still be there. So it's really difficult to me, for me to separate this acute event from some of those other things. I know that's a little long-winded, but it's... Um, it's, it's just sort of my, my cerebral vomiting it all out for you where I feel emotionally right now, if that's fair. Well, it's uh, quite, quite the writer, so I, I saw it, 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 it uh, <laughs> helps. Uh, just well, I have an your, editor. <laughs> just give me your rank uh, and when you left, or have you left? Um, I left the Navy as a 05, as a commander. All right. Uh, Sharon, Miss Lindsay, what? How do you see this situation? Well, first, I agree with what Jeffrey said. Um, we overstayed our welcome in Afghanistan. Once the mission was uh, completed, or the initial mission was completed, we should have made plans to withdraw. There's no question about that. But again, before you withdraw, we should have made sure that there was a stable government in place so that our efforts would not have been in vain. But I'd like to bring another aspect to it, the after effect, because remember, I deal very heavily in the veteran community and the veterans that come home, and we're still dealing with the Vietnam veterans. My concern is the Afghan veterans that were withdrawn, how are they going to take this? You know, as veterans, we look at mission accomplished. We want to complete the mission. This mission was not completed. And so I know that they're going to come home with a sense of failure and a sense of defeat. How do you deal with that on the mental health level? So we're going to have to put into place some real supportive services for those Afghan veterans that were pulled out. Because it feels like, what were we there for all that time and we didn't complete the mission? And you know, that is what we are mandated to do. Complete the mission and then move on to a new mission. So I totally agree with you, but we need to look at the after effects as well. 
Sharon, Sharon, I want to thank you. I'm sorry to interrupt. I want to thank you so much. That is so exactly on point. You know, we can find people for 10 different opinions about when we should have gone in, when we should have come out and all that. And, and uh, there's a lot of valid stuff. And these are after actions that have to be had. But my main concern, Brian's, and I know Don's, is just what you said. You know, I've been in ch- touch with a lot of teammates who are struggling. You know, was that bloodshed for nothing? What, what did my service matter? We're going to see a rise, I am afraid, uh, in suicide rates and mental health breakdowns among veterans mm-hmm. who have served in Afghanistan. And thank God there's people like you that have dedicated their life to, to serving those, those communities of people. It is my primary concern right now. Thank you so much mm-hmm. for bringing that up. Thank you. Point. Uh, Ms. Lindsay, were you finished? And what was your rank when you left? Oh, sure. four. I started as an enlisted and I worked my way up. <laughs> so you work for a living. <laughs> <laughs> That's why as a commanding officer, they couldn't tell me anything because I had been there and done that. <laughs> well, I, I, started, get... I started as an enlisted. Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm sure when you write your book, it will be quite the tale. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Well, we're, we're bringing it on home to you, Don. You're going to yeah. have to make sense of all of this for us, please. <laughs> well, I appreciate your faith in me, Senator. I don't, it may be, uh, it may be misplaced, but all kidding aside, I wanted to start by saying, in, in addition to saying thank you for having us, there's two things that really impressed me about you, Senator, and I, and I don't know you, but the first being that you served before public office, and I can't help but think if more politicians did that, things might be a little bit different in our in our nation right now, and I want to applaud you for that. The second thing I want to applaud you for is before the show started, you made it very clear that you weren't looking for a particular answer to this question. In fact, you very much wanted to solicit our opinions. And I feel like that's something that we have forgotten how to do as a nation is to be able to sit down and have conversations where sometimes we disagree with the people who are sitting across for the table from us. And just because we disagree with them doesn't mean that we have to hate them or their opinion. It means that we're Americans and we can look at things differently. And I just wanna applaud you for doing uh, both of those things before we get started. Um, as you said, my name is, is Don Bentley. I spent 10 years as an Army Apache helicopter pilot. Um, I, one of those years from 2005 to 2006, I deployed to Afghanistan as a uh, Air Cavalry Troop Commander. And, flew in, uh, uh, I don't even know how many missions in Afghanistan. And, and many of those, I was, I had guys and girls throughout Afghanistan. They were in Bagram and Salerno and Asadabad and Jalalabad and Organi. And I spent a lot of time in Bagram and a lot of time flying in and out of Kabul airport because we would, we would often ferry VIPs back and forth and NATO had a presence there as well. And so when, when I looked at the pictures of what happened and, it, you know, it, it strikes all of us who have who have been there and lost friends there and, and brothers and sisters, but just seeing that and seeing that airport I was so familiar with is is just kind of crippling. And and I think I would I would agree with both what Jeff and Sharon said. I think the United the American people without a doubt wanted us, wanted their military to go into Afghanistan and do what it took to keep them safe and keep September 11th from ever happening again. And I think we achieved that very, very quickly. We decimated Al Qaeda, we had the Taliban on the run. And I think what happened next was a tragedy. And, and I think um, there are a million different reasons for that. You know, Part of it, I would, I would quote Admiral uh, McMullen, who at one point after Iraq kicked off, the then commander of Afghanistan asked for an additional, I think it was 500,000 soldiers and McMullen had to say, I can't give those to you because in his, in his quote was something to the effect of, in Iraq, we do what we must. And so in Afghanistan, we do what we can. And I think we as a nation lost our way a little bit there. And when there became another war, or another effort that was detracting what happened in Afghanistan and, and, and frankly had us lose focus as a nation. And I felt like we were treading water there for a while where we weren't sure what exactly uh, we were supposed to be accomplishing there. People compare Afghanistan a lot of times in the, in the troops that we've had there to Germany and Korea. And there's some truth to that, but I feel like there's a little bit, that's a little bit of a disingenuous comparison. And the reason why I say that is after Germany surrendered, there weren't people who were waging an insurgent campaign against the US forces stationed there. 
Nobody was getting shot at. Nobody was getting blown up by IEDs. And I was stationed in Germany, admittedly, you know, 50 years after World War II or more than that, I guess 60 years. And I had my family there. You know, you, you don't take your family to Afghanistan when you're stationed there. I was also stationed in South Korea. That was my first assignment out of flight school. And I was able to take my wife there as well. Nobody's getting shot in Korea. Nobody's getting blown up. And, and again, that I was stationed in Korea probably 30 years after it cooled off. And in, in fairness, Korea is currently in an armistice. It's in a state of war. But again, even when our forces were having trouble with North Korea crossing the DMZ or things, they weren't fighting an all-out insurgency that was still taking place in South Korea that was being fueled um, by, by other state actors. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think there is an argument to be made um, that perhaps we could have, we should have kept a small presence in Afghanistan for stability. Maybe that's true, but I, but I think with the rest of the folks that, that we lost our way at some point in Afghanistan. And I, and I wrote an editorial a couple of weeks ago that said, you know, we probably should have gotten out 10 years ago because, because I, I don't know, I, I find it hard to say what we have accomplished in the 10 years since. Now, having said that, I think the other thing that, that perhaps some of our political leaders are misreading is that while most Americans believe that, I, I think most Americans also would say right now that the way that we handled our exit from Afghanistan has been nothing mm -hmm. short of horrific. It's been nothing mm -hmm. short of horrific, and it didn't have to be done this way. And I think that is, and again, if, if I were if I were somebody's advisor, somebody important that, that's in power right now, what I'd say to them is the American people would back you if you would show the courage that's necessary to get the remaining Americans who are left behind in Afghanistan out and to take care of the men and women who signed up and put their life on the line to help our forces. And right now they're being hunted down for the crime of helping an American. And, and I can't stomach that. When, it, when I got out of the Army, I was an FBI agent for a while, and my job was to run and recruit sources. And the way that you do that is you ask somebody to do something dangerous, but what you tell them in return is, I'm with the FBI, which means the entire weight and power of that organization is going to do everything that it can to protect you. That's the exact same promise that we made to Afghan interpreters, to Afghan assets, to people on the ground who risked their lives to help us and who stayed there after we left because we gave them the word of America, of the United States, that we will not forget you, that we will not leave you behind. And, and I think that the fact that we're doing that now is a tragedy. I will join you in, in that uh, belief, sir. Uh, it should be noted and, and, and for, for your sake. I. I am a Democrat, but I consider myself a very independent Democrat. Nobody, nobody tells me what to do and what to think. I mean, imagine that. Um, and I will, there are no good Democratic ideas. There are no good Republican ideas. There are good ideas and bad ideas. And we should be brave enough, bold enough to say this one is good or this one is bad. Let me state on the, on the record. I absolutely supported the U.S. going into Afghanistan at 9-11. As a matter of fact, if I wasn't so old, I would have gone in myself. I would have re-upped. Uh, I felt that strongly about it. it, it to me, that was a just war. Uh, by any, any way that you want to look at what is a just war, that is absolutely a just war. Uh, and and I, if I am a little different as a politician, it's because I, I've been in foxholes. And, and in a foxhole, you, your first thought is not whether they're black or white or any. Your first thought is a strange one. Strange. First, can they stay awake? <laughs> because a person who can't stay awake is not, is, is, is a danger to you. The second one is, can they hit their target? Yeah. Right. And those type of thoughts come 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 through there, and you know, uh, so I look at politics in a little bit vastly different than these. You're right. If more uh, veterans served, or more of these politicians were were veterans, there'd be fewer wars. 
<laughs> and we will win them. They would be That's absolutely <laughs> right. Absolutely would be true. Pure, and we would we would lead, we would tell everybody we're gonna live in peace now, but we're gonna live in peace or you're gonna be in pieces. Uh, mm -hmm. We would take it and we would look at it vastly different. So having said that, oh, I, my last point that I want to make is why this is important to me, uh, ladies and gentlemen watching, uh, that unit, most of those Marines that the last Americans that we know who, who died in service or so far, or the last ones were from my unit, 2nd Battalion, 1st Marine Division, 1st Regiment, that's my, that's where I train the, the Hollywood Marines uh, for those, for the insiders. Uh, and that's an inside joke there between Marines. Um, that San Diego, that's, I served in the pen. I spent three years in the pen, Camp Pendleton, California, my friend. <laughs> and that is, the, those are the guys. And that was the age that I was in. I went in at 18. As soon as, as soon as I could learn how to write my name or whatever, I was, and I was a grunt. Uh, you know, I, you know, a young tough guy. Where will young tough guys go? We're gonna go in the Marine. <laughs> and where are you gonna go in the Marines? You're gonna go in the grunt unit. Um, uh, but I did bump into the seal, and I have a lot of respect. For seals, uh, uh, we could argue whether they're marines or not, but I have a lot of <laughs> respect for seals, uh, and so I'm I'm a uh, I'm in awe. And then to ride the helicopters, the Apaches and others uh, that you guys, I mean, you know, that draws fire. That's that's a <laughs> that's a magnet. Look, helicopter American shooting. But um, and more often than not, they don't hit. Well, that's that's something he said about that, which brings us back here. Uh, but Mr. Wilson, um, imagine this assignment. You are now by the powers invested in me. I have made you an author, a best-selling one, and I have said I want you to write. <laughs> the two-page history of our um, exit from Kabul. You have two pages, and now you're here to tell me what those two, two pages are look like. And, and may I remind you that this is a family TV, sir. <laughs> well, I'm a, I'm a fiction writer, so I'll give you the two pages of what I wish it had looked like. Oh, my. Um, and I think that this is something that is shared by most people that have served. And Senator, I bet you're no exception. Um, I won't speak for you, of course. But um, one of the reasons that Don made that great point about if only more politicians were veterans is because of the way this was handled. I don't think there are bad people making these decisions. And what I mean is I don't think they have bad hearts. I don't think that they don't care. I don't think that they are like, oh, all these people are going to die. I don't care. Mm -hmm. I think they just don't know. I think it's a naivete, and I think it's combined with an arrogance that they know best, and they don't get the feedback from mm -hmm. the people who actually know. That's my opinion of, of why we get into these problems. If you look back at Vietnam, isn't that sort of what happened, right? Once it be started to be run by the politicians, instead of get be the generals who have a goal, everything went downhill very fast. And, and so if you look just at the exit and we don't talk about anything but that, what went wrong and what should have been done differently? There's a number of things that have been in the press and most of them I agree with. Uh, and again, not partisan press, but just general information from military people. The idea that we gave up Bagram was, was major blunder number one. Um, I've been to Kabul, I've been to Bagram if I had a choice between which one of these I wanted to defend to uh, give cover to an exit, it would definitely be Bagram. It's a much more defensible airfield. It's enormous. You can conduct a much larger scale operation. Kabul sits in this giant bowl where all of these people can look down on you on your single runway that you're trying to move things in and out of. It's just a nightmare logistically. 
I am willing to excuse that there are people in political power who don't understand and know that, but ask the people that do and listen to them. So step one in my fictitious withdrawal would have been we would have maintained control of Bagram. We also would have kept people like Don and his and his teammates at work. We would have said, look, during this portion, let's begin bringing people out. Let's start using special operation forces to develop to deliver both Americans and our allies that want to leave to this field that we control and to make sure they get there safely, we will provide air support with Don and his friends to keep the Taliban at bay. You can argue whether we could have or should have known that it would fall as quickly as it did. We all knew it would fall eventually. So let's just control the situation until we can get people safely to a place where they can be extracted. And I think that had we done just that, uh, there's, you could write, many more than two pages on on how to do it in detail. But if you had started with those two things, not not and the third one I would add is not ever set a deadline of this is the day we're gone. You're gone when everyone's done. You're gone when everybody's out. Um, you can have a, you know, oh, we hope to do it by this day or whatever, but we're not going to get in a contract with the enemy for the day we're leaving. And so lots of blame to go around. But had we done those three things, not set an artificial deadline, controlled Bagram as our extraction point, and controlled Bagram with good defense, allowing special operators to go out and get the people that want to come and protecting them and our Afghan partners from the air with Don and his friends, this entire thing would have been completely different. A friendly argument about uh, Bagram, sir? Absolutely. Um, the, the one advantage of Kabul is that it's sitting in the metropole. It's surrounded by people. So it's easier for people to get to, to get to Bagram, you're, you're, is, you're, you're just known. Anybody headed toward Bagram is going to be U.S. type, where the, a Kabul at least you're surrounded by well-meaning people who just want out yeah. instead of the, the high value people. I, for sure, I don't disagree with that, Senator, but I will say this, if, if what we controlled was Kabul with a wide perimeter outside the city from which we could maintain operational control of flow in and out of the city and from the city into the airport mm -hmm. and keep using that air support we talked about to keep the Taliban outside of the, that perimeter, then then you you would be right. Then, then that you're right. We could have done it that way. And the fact that it would have been a slower logistical process because of the limitations of the airfield would have been less important. So I don't, I don't disagree with that. That's certainly another way to have done it. Had we controlled Kabul, which we did not. I'd add one caveat to what to what Jeff said, Senator. Like I said, I'd, it's about a ten or fifteen minute flight between the two. I, I've flown it a gazillion times, probably. And what I would have done is kept both, because what you could have done is had a nonstop stream of airplanes coming in and out of Bagram, mm -hmm. ferrying people there. You could have loaded people up at Kabul in helicopters if you needed to and taken them there. And there's there's so many. The, 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 the choice, and you bring up an excellent point, but to me, I, I wouldn't have done an either or, I would have done both. And that's part of what I'd mm -hmm. say is we had the footprint there to be able to do that um, had we had the, 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 the will to do that. And I think that's what, and I apologize if I'm jumping out of order a little bit, but the, the thing about military mm -hmm. folks, and you know this, Senator, everybody on this call does, is a military leader does what they're told to do. And so if you tell the 82nd Airborne, what I want you to do is to go in there and establish a presence behind the barricades of the airport and not expand out and not do anything. Just hold that. That's what the planner is going to put in place. If you, on the other hand, say what I want you to do is execute a non-combatant evacuation or operation, a NEO plan. And what we're going to do is establish safe areas throughout Afghanistan, certainly throughout Kabul where we can collect Americans and Afghans, ferry them back to Kabul, mm -hmm. that your charter is to take the 82nd Airborne Division, which by God is the division that stood in between Iraq and Saudi Arabia on their own before Desert Storm happened. I am quite confident they could go do that. And, and, and in fact, we did it in Korea. We practiced non-combatant evacuations all the time. And I think there's a 
I don't I don't want to speak for the president and I cannot imagine the pain that he is under right now of, of sitting uh, and sitting and receiving 13 dead girls and boys who, who came home from it. But I think sometimes there's a there's a, a sense for politicians, especially ones who haven't served, that said we need to protect the military. We need to do what we can. Those guys and girls signed up because they want to fight. You don't join the 82nd Airborne. You don't join the Marine Corps because you want to stand huddled behind barriers. Those guys and girls were itching to go do the job that, frankly, everybody in the service would love the opportunity to go rescue Americans. I mean, that's what we all signed up for. And the funny thing about veterans, and Sharon, I'd be interested if you've seen this, is most of my friends, even though we're all old men and women, we're trying to figure out, could we get back to Kabul? Could we get back there and actually do something in the last week? Because by God, that's what we signed up to do. And I feel like if we would have had the willpower to say, this is now your mission scope, we could have told the Taliban, we're the United States of America, and this can work out two ways. You can stand aside and let us collect our people and get out of the way, or we can do what we did in 2001 right now and overturn your country again. The choice is yours. And that is a completely different message than saying to them, please, pretty please, let our people come to the airport. Sharon, I, I, I don't know. Wow. <laughs> save me, Ms. Lindsay. Save me from myself. <laughs> no, I, I totally agree. You know, when you, you know, um, just let me share something. When you talked about how politicians look at things as opposed to veterans, we look at things with getting a mission done, but we also look at things in a very clear, concrete manner. And we tend to do things in an orderly, concise manner. I happen to have been in Guyana when Guyana uh, took over, well, when the government asked the English to leave. And what they did not put in place at that particular time was a clear transition of power. Mm -hmm. And so the politicians wanted the English out of Guyana, and so they just put them out. Meanwhile, the country semi-collapsed because nobody knew how to run the government, nobody knew how to do the, the industry. And so they didn't take the time to put a plan in place, what I call a transition plan. Like there was no transition plan. And that's what happened in Afghanistan. There really was not a transition plan, like Don said, to pull every ballot in a systematic manner. It was just a free for all. And that's what happened. So again, I agree with both of you in the sense that we need to have more veterans with that clear, concise planning to help to run the country, or if not, at least get some veteran input. Because you could tell there was no military strategy in terms of that withdrawal. It was, let's get our people out and that's it. Well, we would have done it in a much more controlled, organized manner, definitely. Well, I will, I, uh, from the inside, I can attest that I have not seen evil politicians. I haven't seen these guys that I thought that I would bump into. I haven't seen any I've seen people who are callous. I've seen people who, you know, don't have much of a heart. But I have not met people who willingly would just go and surrender lives and say, ah, what the heck. Um, I haven't met these uh, TV villains that do so good in these shows that you guys write about. Um, I haven't met those. I have met exactly the type you, you mean. Uh, Well-meaning people. Who are too mm -hmm. doggone smart for their own good, who are too smart to listen, who, mm -hmm. you know, just because they can recognize on the map where Afghanistan is, now they're willing, ready to tell you everything about it. I mean, you know, they've got the cliches down back, the, the, you know, the, the death of empires. I mean, you know, the graveyard of empire. They got the cliches. Um, but it's the understanding. But I'm going to do something different. In this saintly assemblage, the devil absolutely needs an, an, an advocate, and I'm going to be him for that moment. Uh, and I'm going to start with you, Commander Wilson. I'm going to uh, argue that this was the best that could be done uh, under those conditions. Um, and the reasons that 
that this was the best because a no one knew how soon that this government would collapse. The the CIA and others were saying six months to a year ish or more. Uh, the best information was saying so many months out. Uh, if, if intelligence failure, absolutely. Where we did not understand that the Taliban was buying our leaders left, right, and center, but part of it was the you know the the corruption that we allowed there that ate at at the mission and ultimately led us to uh, this was the best that anyone could have done under these conditions. What say you, sir? Well, I will I will respectfully disagree. Uh, in this in this way. Um, and it sort of comes back to what we were talking about, the difference between politicians saying, do this and do it this way, and politicians saying, here's what we want you to do. You're the subject matter experts. Take care of it. Had they done that, then what would have happened is you would have had people with the insight of the four of us, people who know that no good plan survives contact with the enemy or, or even passage through the wire, people who know that warfare is kinetic, that the enemy is unpredictable and doesn't do what you want him to do. And so what would have been different would simply have been this, allow your military force to be kinetic, allow them to adapt and overcome, allow them to say, well, we didn't expect the Taliban to creep this far this fast. So we're going to change the plan and engage them and keep them outside of Kabul, keep them off of Bagram. Hey, we didn't expect that. I accept that. I have no problem with people saying nobody saw this coming. I mean, there are people that are debating how true that is. I get that. I don't like to get into the who knew what second guessing because we'll never know. But what I will say is that a properly empowered, not powerful, but empowered military will prepare for these contingencies. You know, Don will tell you as a pilot, uh, he's got a contingency plan and a little book on his thigh for every single possible mishap that's going to happen in that aircraft. Mm -hmm. And he knows it and he's memorized it and he doesn't even need to look in his book, although they make him carry it, because he's trained to do that. And that's what our military can do. So the only way that I would disagree with you, Senator, would be that. Yes, there were unforeseen things. But if you empower your military to be kinetic and to achieve a mission set that you give them instead of an operational plan that you provide, this still could have been avoided. Would it have been chaotic? Yes. Would it have degraded to this point? I believe no. Well, well, Don, the same question, but let me yeah. let me argue against against that. Uh, the military had a go of it for the last twenty years or so, uh, and did not win. The, the battle, the war, rather, the war. Um, would the, the politicians, they didn't do, they did as badly, as poorly, if you wish. And, and that's a fair point. And there's some, I, I, I hope you run for national office, Senator. I, I really do. I think that, I think that your, your outlook is very unique. And something that you said in the, in the beginning is that if you haven't, if you haven't actually served, then you don't understand the mindset of those who do. And I'm paraphrasing what you said a little bit. And, and this is the mindset of those who do, is that veterans are usually the last ones who want to go to war. And then yes. once they do, once this, the civilian leadership, rightfully so, has made the decision to do that, then they want to wage that war as violently as possible so it can be as brief as possible. And so what you have to, again, if, if you're a leader who sends troops into harm's way, what you have to understand is it might be messy. And what you can't do is tell people, I want you to accomplish this particular goal, but I don't want to get any boys and girls killed at the same time. You certainly want that. You want with all your heart for that not to happen. But if you're going to send men and women into harm's way, your primary consideration can't be one of optics, and it frankly can't be one of casualties, which you have to do as the leader is have done as much due diligence as possible and said, yes, it is worth sending American sons and daughters potentially to die for. And then once you make that decision, you need to get out of the way and let them do their jobs. And there's, there's something that's very, very unique to the American military, and it's something that's called commander's intent. 
And so in the Army Operations Order, there's a paragraph in which the mission is stated, and then there's a section that's called the commander's intent. And the purpose of the commander's intent is that when all else fails, when everything else goes into the crapper, that subordinate leader knows what he or she is supposed to do. And there's a famous example of that of General H.R. Masters back in the, in the desert, in the Gulf War. It's called the Battle of 73 Easting. And that he actually went beyond what his limited advance was because he saw his target, he knew what the, his commanders of intent was, and he had the flexibility to change the plan, to execute it, to get the outcome his commander used. That is something that is wholly unique to the U.S. military. Almost every military in the world is very top-down driven, is very – the commanders at the junior level don't have the ability to do that. Going all the way back to your example – when the, when the circumstances on the ground didn't meet what was briefed and what was anticipated, what I would have loved mm -hmm. to have seen is to let that commander execute his commander's intent. Mm -hmm. And his commander's intent was to bring all of those Americans home. And by God, we're going to do that, and we're going to stay there until we've done it. And that's what I would have loved to have seen done differently. Before I get to you, Ms. Lindsay, uh, another uh, very important idea of uh, example of commander's intent took place in the Civil War, where one of the leading generals, and I forget which one had, the Union generals had a chance to end the Civil War early, uh, and he had defeated General Lee, as a matter of fact, and, but he did not cross a certain river because he was told, go up to the river and stop, and therefore, he allowed the other group, the uh, this uh, the Confederates to regroup, get right. their, their breath, and the war went on for years afterward. Commander's intent is so important. This is what I'm trying to teach my own team here and during the stuff that we do here. It's not mm -hmm. just what I say. What am I trying to do? What what is the goal, the purpose? What are we trying to do? Commander's intent, because you're right. Politics is also that. It's the best plan is finished as soon as, soon as there's contact because the enemy does have a vote. Uh, Ms. Lindsay, you can respond to any and all of these things that have been thrown out. But be well, aware, I'm going to be the devil's advocate here. <laughs> <laughs> no, everything that has been brought forth has been very truthful and very honest and very analytical, and I agree with that. There definitely could have been handled a lot more organized and a lot more efficiently. But then we also have to look at, like you said, management comes from top down. At what point do we, quote, disobey orders? Mm -hmm. Even though we know that it may be right, at what point do we take our personal career and put it on the line in order to accomplish the mission? And how many people have done that? So from a personal perspective, you may know what's right, but are you being disobedient? You know, are you not following orders? So it is sort of a catch-22. But when you look at it, again, not to be repetitive, we needed to have more military intervention. We needed to have more military input into the overall plan, you know, to sit behind, and we know it, to sit behind your desk and make life and death decisions is not the way it should be. You really got to be boots on the ground. You really have to have been in the foxhole and in the trenches to really know the ultimate ramifications and foresee what this action is going to bring. And also militarily, we always have a backup plan. We always have a backup plan. When the generators went out when we was in the field, you know what our backup plan was when generators went out? The lights of the deuce in the quarter. You know those big, oh, yes. big lights? Yes. That's how we took the meals at 4 o'clock in the morning. We always had a backup plan. And that's what they did not have. They did not have a backup plan. Like you said, you never can anticipate what the enemy is going to throw with you. But the military should be always in a state of anticipation, in a state of readiness. So to me, that never should have happened. Well, uh, let me make it worse for you, Miss Lindsay. And <laughs> if if uh, here's the the worst, if this situation could get any worse, 
I'm told there are press reports that the Taliban was so taken aback by their own rapid uh, movements to the capital that when they came to the capital, they offered the US, you can control Kabul or we will control Kabul. Uh, and we made a faithful choice um, not to do it. Why would we make that choice? Well, the question becomes, where were the orders coming from not to make that choice? Were they coming from the top down? Was there really any dialogue between the military and the powers to be in terms of what was the best solution? See, we don't know what happened between the lines or what happened behind the scenes, but it's evident that there was not a military command present in order to make those real hardcore decisions. Because you know how we do things. We go in and our justice is swift and absolute. We come in and we get the mission and we leave. Swift and absolute. That's the military mindset. Well, perhaps, Mr. Wilson, you have some... If this is true, why, I mean, that would have been, from my point of view, the best of all worlds based mm -hmm. on the horrid, horrible hand that you've been given that the Taliban or perhaps some faction of the Taliban, because they are not this united front that people are hearing, some faction of the Taliban has said, you can control Kabul or we will control it. Um, why, what arguments could be made for not controlling Kabul under those conditions, sir? Well, I can't think of a single one. I mean, I got to agree with Sharon here. Like this sounds like a decision that was made by somebody that has not been in the field, has not got tactical mm -hmm. experience because it's, it's hard for me to, even with my, creative writing imagination. Think of a scenario wherein anybody who has America's interests and our allies' interests would say no to that. that and I've heard those reports too, that this was, uh, that this was an option that we turned down. Um, so I, I really don't have a, an answer for that question other than to say there isn't one. And it was a colossal blunder uh, that unfortunately probably cost the lives of 13 American service members. Again, not implying evil intent or anything like that. But it's, but it's really about understanding warfare. It's about understanding tactics and strategy. But here's a war we've been in for 20 years and here's another element. You need to understand your enemy. Yes. Those of us that have served in Afghanistan who have sat down in small Pashtun villages and had tea with Pashtun uh, mm -hmm. fighters, whether you know hoping they're good, not knowing if they were, <laughs> you learn something about the mindset of these people and how they think and how they work. And I will say, I, I want to get this out there. My experience with the Afghan people is that they are an amazing, beautiful people. I have had experience that were wholly positive with our Afghan partners. They have heart, they have soul, they're courageous. They love their families. That's a very family oriented culture. Um, and, and so I think that if you're making that decision and you have no military experience and then you couple it with the fact that because you don't, you also have no firsthand experience with the mindset of both the good and bad people in Afghanistan, that's when, like Sharon was saying, you turn that decision over to the subject matter expert, which is the military commander on the ground and say, what do you think we should do? Because I promise you, it's not even feasible. <laughs> That, that question was asked to a military commander and he said oh yeah no let them have the city and we'll just stay on the airport they can't have happened yeah yeah i, I guess well well don i'm gonna i'm coming to you but i'm making it work i'm gonna make it harder i'm gonna argue mindset that will allow you to imagine if you believe that you cannot trust the the taliban and they are luring you into a trap that if you you take the city now they've got you in, they got you surrounded uh, yeah. and they can fire on all sides um, and it will need much more troops to take them and guard 
and hold the whole city. We saw the disaster in Iraq at the fall of sure. Saddam Hussein, how it was out of control. All of these fears played in the minds of whoever was making this decision, if this offer uh, is real and who and which faction of the Taliban is making this and can they keep that? And as a matter of fact, the faction that took Kabul is one of led by one of the most notorious uh, yep. anti-Americans. Can you trust this? Yeah, I think you absolutely can't trust that. And and that's and and I think we've been in Afghanistan long enough to know that, right? I mean, there there's something mm -hmm. President Reagan said when he was referencing the Soviet Union is trust but verify. And so I think mm -hmm. to me what it comes back to to build on something Jeff said and 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 something Sharon had alluded to before is the worst part of me thinks I don't I don't think there are evil politicians either. What I wonder, though, is if we went into this more concerned with optics than outcome, and we were so concerned with what I don't want to see are American sons and daughters coming home in coffins. What I don't want to see is American sons and daughters getting dragged through the streets of Kabul, like what happened in Mogadishu. What I, and so what we did is went into this with a sense of fear and let that guide us. And what we were more concerned about is what this looked like versus what needed to be done. You know, one of the, I had several defining moments in my life in Afghanistan and, and one of them had nothing to do with being shot at, but I was standing in a talker, a tactical operations center where a young infantry company commander was, brief, was briefing his um, brigade commander on an air assault we were about to do. So I was gonna provide gunship for, support for it. He was gonna put his guys onto the ground into what we knew was heavily Taliban controlled area and in fact we had just lost a helicopter in that in that same spot and so he started his brief to his company or to his brigade commander and he said sir my goal is to bring all my guys home again and then he started to talk and his brigade commander interrupted him and he said son i know that's what you want to do but that's probably not going to happen and it was and it was an innocent comment by the company commander who wanted to give a very reassuring this is what my goal was and it was a very gentle correction by a senior leader that says, your job right now, as hard as it is and as horrible it is, is not to think first about bringing everyone home. It's to think first about the mission that I've given you. And, it's, and your mission is to seize that ground. And I think that's what, again, to me, the theme that all of us keep coming back to in this conversation is where does the delineation between the military and the, and the political leaders who who, who lead it and should lead it because that's that's another thing that makes America you know a, a great country and a unique country is that there has to be that handoff where the civilian mm -hmm. government says this is your mission and then you trust your military leaders to execute it and you stand behind them and if they come to you and say here is what it takes here is what Kabul looks like right now it is my opinion that if we don't seize Kabul here's what's going to happen. And if we do seize Kabul, we're not going to walk into it. The Taliban are probably going to double cross us. Here's what it is. But this is what the cost is going to be. Then you have to back up the military leader and allow them to accomplish the task that you've given them. But if you sit back, and this isn't just our politicians, unfortunately, the ability now to, to look at an evolving battlefield from thousands of miles away now has given senior leaders and they have to watch themselves that they're not jumping down into a squad leader's head and say, hey, move your guy 10 feet to the right. Move, right? You have to have the trust in your subordinate leaders and doubly so between the government and the military that executes the wishes that they had. And so to, to answer your question, I think what if we're going to go into Afghanistan you have to go into Afghanistan with the mindset of this could potentially get messy. Sons and daughters are potentially going to come home and flag drape coffins. But you know what? We don't leave Americans behind ever. And we're willing to pay the price and tell the world that we're willing to pay that price to bring Americans home. We're going to do that. That's what should have happened. Well, let me say this. And Sharon, I'm coming to you. We're in the last minutes of this podcast, but now let's talk of veterans. You've got a bunch of folk 
more veterans, I'm, I, I'm forgetting which one of these writers have pointed out that more veterans, more, more military people have died from suicide than mm -hmm. from the, the battles uh, that we have fought. Uh, and I'm talking about military people of the Afghan Iraq uh, conflicts uh, have died from suicide. Uh, 30, that number 30,000 seems to stay in my mind uh, than have died uh, on the battlefield. Um, Sharon, you, this is where you shine more than the, the three of us. <laughs> what do we do with these folk? Well, the first thing is we provide services. Okay. okay. But, but we need to understand the underlying issues. A lot of, I wouldn't say most of, but too many of our newer veterans look to the military as family. As you know, the family structure has broken down. You know, the two parent household is being reduced considerably. And so when someone does join the military, they're looking for another family. They're looking for another home. And they're coming to the table with a high level of expectation. And so when that second option that they've given themselves sort of dissipates, it's like, where do I go? It's like, I, I didn't have a family here. I thought the military was my family. And now they disappointed me. And so what we have to do is we have to kind of they're already broken down. We've got to rebuild them up. We've got to reinstall their faith in providing services. And as we all know, a lot of things have been contracted out to non-military people. And that is really a travesty. And I have even uh, testified before the city council, the housing programs, the site programs, they're all being farmed out and contracted out to non-military people who really don't understand what it is to be a veteran really doesn't know the pride that they have in being a veteran or that that pride and dignity has been taken away from them. So they're lost. It's they're almost like in a desert in terms of finding the services. And when you apply to services, it takes you six months to get an appointment. Okay? You know, I deal with that every day, trying to get appointments for some of my veterans that I know have issues, right? And when they do get an appointment, it's with a non-military provider that really does not care doesn't really have the level of understanding that a veteran does. So unless we can, number one, get, because I tend to be very definitive. If I have an issue, I come up with definitive answers. Stop or reduce the amount of non-veteran contracts that we're given to agencies that provide services. Make sure that they're veteran deep. Make sure that they have concrete military backup, not just hiring somebody, a veteran or two, and saying, oh, we got veterans on staff. Someone that has been in combat, someone who has really been in the trenches, someone who has at least served in the military, right? Let's make sure that they have that background before contracts for housing, for site service, PTSD services are awarded. Let it not just be a service company and then everybody else wants to get on board to make the money. Let them be truly veteran oriented. Mr. Wilson, Mr. Bentley, let me modify the question. Uh, certain spin on it. You have the number varies at least 100 Americans and 30,000, 20, whatever thousand. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, folk who believed in America, um, who, who worked with, there's a word, worked with the Americans there. Um, what do we do, Mr. Wilson, followed by you, Mr. Ben? About the people that are still there, you're saying? Yes, sir. Sir, yes, sir. Uh, I, you know, this is going to sound very vague and generic, but we do whatever it takes. Uh, we as a, as a government, we as a nation, we as a people, and we as the military do not leave our fellow citizens and our allies mm -hmm. behind on the battlefield. Right. And this is still a battlefield. If this is a place where they're being hunted by the enemy that we were in combat with weeks ago, then that is leaving them on the battlefield. And so 
whatever it takes. And, and I'm not saying that that doesn't mean diplomatic solutions. I'm not suggesting that the only possible solution is overwhelming military might. I believe that military, the use of the military should always be one of the last resort. So here we are now, here's the situation. My, as a military person, the way I would handle it is I, as, the, as a nation, as a people, would tell the people that are keeping these folks from getting safely out of the country, you have this, here's a time when a deadline works. You have this amount of time to allow the people that wanna leave Afghanistan because they are partnered with us or because they're American citizens or connected to America, you have this amount of time to let them safely move out of your country with or without your help. And if you have not done that by this date, we're coming back. I know you don't want that. You don't want us back there. We don't want to be there. You don't want us here. So you deliver them safely. And if that doesn't happen, we must have the resolve to go and get those people, whether it's with a highly kinetic special operations type approach or overwhelming military support and send the Rangers in, take an airfield and say, we're starting over. I don't know the answer and the, con the conditions on the ground would dictate that. But the only answer is to let the enemy know that it is not acceptable for our allies and our citizens to be left behind on the battlefield. We're coming for them. You will help us or you will pay the price. I think it's the only answer that works. And I say that not just because it's a good answer in general, but because with this enemy, it is the only answer that ever mm -hmm. works. No, we don't trust the Taliban. No, absolutely not. But what they do understand from 20 years of fighting with us is what overwhelming military resolve looks like, and they don't want any of that. And so if we have the resolve to back that threat up, I believe we can get these people safely out. Same question, Mr. Bentley. However, a military military and diplomacy in this sense uh, almost clashes. Can you do both at the same time? And what percentage of which are you going to use? What's your formula, sir? Yeah, I think, so there's a great scene in, in one of the, um, in one of the movies about Winston Churchill, in which it's the middle of the Battle of Britain, and most of the parliamentary, his fellow politicians want him to go discuss terms with Hitler, want him to surrender. And, and Winston Churchill gets to the point where he doesn't know. And so he gets on the subway and he rides around and he talks to, to average citizens. He talks to his fellow, you know, Londoners. He talks to UK and, and they tell him to a man and a woman, keep fighting, keep fighting. And I feel like if, if, if President Biden was able to walk around the U.S. right now and talk to American people, they would tell him, we will back whatever you have to do to bring those people home. Whatever yeah. price we have to pay, whether it means we reinvade in Afghanistan, whatever we have to do, we will back you, Mr. President. And that's what I would tell him right now. I will back you whatever you have to do to bring those people home. And to your question, I think we forget, like 20 years ago, what we did with the Northern Alliance and, and, and very few troops, we rocked the Taliban's world. And we did a combination. There's, and I think it's the, the book on Rumsfeld. There's a famous scene where a CIA case officer walks into a Northern Alliance or a Taliban or, or one of the warlords villages and says, here's 50,000 bucks. Come join us. And he says, nope. And then the CIA guy says, OK. And he walks out and they call a JDAM down right next to him. And the next day, the CIA guy comes in and says, here's 30,000 bucks to join us. And he said, yes, I will. And that's what, whatever it takes to bring those people home, that's what we should do. And our military and intelligence community is incredibly resourceful. They did it once. They could do it again. We just have to have the political will to do it. And I, and I think the American people would give him that if he just asked for it. Mm -hmm. You may be right in the sense of a very narrow mission, a very, very narrow mission that has no creep, that, 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 that has no deadline, no false deadline also, uh, that says there are 100 Americans, there are 10,000, 20, whatever the number of uh, allies here, when these folk are gone, we have served our time and we can go. Um, he, he probably 
could get that. Yes, there would be there would be protests against that, sir. There would be well-meaning people who will say at this moment, especially at this moment, my God, you all of that you should have did before. Let's nothing sure. you can do with this one. This is the graveyard of empires. Let's not no. make a bad thing worse, sir. Mr. No, I, I was going to say real quick, I, I agree with you, but that's the amazing thing about being an American is, is 10 of us can't ever agree on anything at the same time. And I think, <laughs> I think that's fine. But I think if you look at the same amount of support that President Bush had across America when September 11th happened, I would be willing to bet that President Biden would get close to that same level of support across. I mean, you just look at the call right now, other than the fact you guys live in New York, I'm in Texas, Jeff's down in Florida, other than the fact that we were all in the military, we don't we don't have a whole lot in common. And every one of us are sitting here on this call saying, Mr. President, bring our people home. Do what you have to to bring our people home. I think he would have broad support for that. And I would just add, Don, to that, this idea that um, the, the hardest part of a politician's job, and Senator, I know you get this. Um, I've got a lot of respect for you more now that I've been speaking with you than ever before. I know that you get this. The the, what makes being a politician a hard job is that you're never going to get universal support. <laughs> you're, you, as a right. politician, took an oath to do what was best for the nation and her people, and that's what you do even when it's not popular. And so, yeah, there's going to be protests. You're right. The, you're, as a politician, you paralyze yourself if you're waiting for a unanimous vote of support because it's never going to happen. You take the, you take the pulse of the nation, you see what they'll support in general, and you ride it out, making the best decision for your people, for your constituents and your nation that you can. And, you know, if we had more, more politicians like you who are willing to do that, we wouldn't be having this conversation at all. You're, you're right about that. My friends, I'm, I'm going to let you have 30 seconds to make your closing, uh, but I, and I'll give you a stall so you can get your thing <laughs> together. Um, I am a progressive politician. I mean, you know, Bernie all the way. However, let's be clear. Um, you, I see no contradiction between that and being a patriotic American uh, who understand that um, when I'm on that wall, <laughs> there is nobody, we can talk, we can, man, we can have a lot of conversation. You may be right and I, I will reason with you left, right and center, but you are not bringing hell here um, I will discuss with you, hell, I'll, I'll do whatever, we could discuss history and all kinds of stuff, um, but there will be no breaching of the wall. The American people will be safe uh, by whatever, whatever it takes. That, the wall, in that sense, my friends, is real. It's not a wall against people. It should, it should not be a wall against the world. It should be a wall that says, let's invite more people to this way of thinking. And I'm speaking about democracy. To this way of thinking. And sooner or later, if we get enough, then we can knock down all these walls. But until until that point is reached, um, nobody's coming raising hell here. And if you do, you're going to have to take what goes with it. And, um, and you're going you're gonna to find that it's better to be my friend than my enemy. It's far better to be my friend than my enemy. And that should be an American position regardless of where you fall on the ideological spectrum of whatever. Uh, and that should be true for all Americans. Um, if, you, if you were here for 400 years, God bless you. If you got here four minutes ago and you took the oath or whatever, you're covered. Uh, and if you are fighting to get in here, my Afghan friends, uh, if you're fighting to get in here, um, then, then, then that my arms are open also. And incidentally, I just found out that uh, Kennedy Airport, which is in my district, 
is a, one of the receiving places for the Afghans. Um, I'm about to go there. Uh, I'm trying to work on the official permission, the bureaucratic nonsense, that, that bureaucratic nonsense, so I could go and personally welcome them to America and, and, uh, and, and say, listen, uh, you are very welcome here. Uh, you, you stood with us in a very difficult place. You are welcome here. Um, well, there I go. I have, so I've given you enough time to get your 30 seconds and more <laughs> conversation together. We'll start with you, Mr. Bentley. We started with you last. You are now first. The first Thank shall you. be last. <laughs> uh, here's, here's what I would say is that the only thing, is, if, if I got to talk to President Biden right now, I, I would say, Mr. President, don't leave Americans in Afghanistan and help us honor the oath to the Afghan people who stood up, who shed blood alongside of us, who put themselves and their families at risk. We need to bring those people back. And, and, and we can do that. And, and if the five of us agree on it, I'm, I think you're going to find most Americans agree on it. And, and the constraints that are on us right now are self-imposed constraints. If 20 years ago we went into Afghanistan and in a couple of months' times with guys on the back of horses calling in airstrikes, destroyed Al-Qaeda and rocked the Taliban, we could go find these people and bring them home. That's what I would say. Well put, sir. Madam Lindsay. Uh, I lost my video. I see. We still see you. Can you hear me? And we still hear you. We see Can and you? we see. Yes, yes, we see and hear oh, you. Okay, because I had initially lost my video. That's all right. Um, we see you. My, my audio. Okay. In closing, I think now that the whole withdrawal has taken place and we're still trying to clean up the aftermath of the withdrawal. Number one, we definitely have to bring our troops and our allies home that's not even negotiable because we do not leave any man behind. That is just a military mandate. But secondly, we need to look at the next wave of the aftermath of the Afghanistan. I call it debacle. And we really need to look at the services that we need to have ready. We need not think about it. We need to be about it. We need to put some services in place, some concrete services, as soon as their boots hit the ground here in the United States. I know they go through a debriefing, but once they finish that initial military debriefing, <laughs> excuse me, we need to have services in place for them. I'm talking about concrete military based services, not fluff. You know, we need to have some real uh, military people giving them some constructive counseling and providing housing and PTS services and mental health services. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Additionally, we need to go with the uh, battle buddy concept, mm -hmm. right? They do that all the time. I know they are infrequent, but that battle buddy concept has really saved a lot of veterans from committing suicide. You assign somebody, and we've had veterans in our committee, and you probably know and see that, who is literally sat up all night with a veteran when they got that call, okay? To try to take them through that real dark time in their life when they really wanted to commit suicide. So I think we need to really bring it down on a one-to-one -one level, get all of those veterans or, you know, uh, at least two battle buddies. If one is not available, they can call another one to help them get through this crisis. Because we're really, we're just seeing the tip of the iceberg when they come back and we see the effects of it. Yeah. Well, Commander, you are called upon to uh, to give a, your benediction here, sir. I'm going to show off my brevity for you, Senator. I have three points, and they're all going to take less than 30 seconds. The first one is hoo to everything that both of these great people said. Um, I agree with Don. I agree with Sharon. We bring everyone home. The second point I would like to leave people with is 
We are Americans. We're not Republicans. We're not Democrats. We're not independents. We're not black. We're not white. We're not anything except Americans. And the moment we realize that, and we realize the things that bring us together are much stronger than the things that tear us apart, we'll be a better nation and we'll find ourselves in less political turmoil because we're less divided. And finally, I will say directly to my fellow veterans, please listen to what Sharon is saying. There are services out there and available. Yes, as she's pointing out, there are things about them that could be improved and they were working on that, but you have to have the responsibility of reaching out for them. It does no good to have uh, a wonderful person like Sharon ready to help you if you don't seek that help. In this difficult time when you're questioning your service, if you are, if you're questioning the loss, if you are, I beg you, reach out for those services and reach out to your teammates. Reach out to the people that you served with. Be in community. That's how we survive these difficult situations. And if you have no one else to call, you go to our website, andrews-wilson.com, you find me, send us an email. We will help you. We will direct you to someone like Sharon. We will reach out to you and communicate with you. But I beg you, please don't suffer through this if you don't have to. We're here for you. Your country is here for you. You know, I'm really honored that I have had the pleasure of spending this time with you, with you good folk. Um, it is reaffirming of the oath that we take which has no time lim limit on it. Uh, and that you veterans, all of us veterans need to understand that, that, that our struggle against enemies, foreign and domestic has no time limit. It doesn't stop when you come home or when you put up your boots or whatever you do. Uh, you need to find a way to serve. Perhaps this is a, a way of being healthy if you wish. Uh, you've been taught to serve, you, you have got the spirit to serve, find a way, uh, you know, one way is politics, politics or politics, if you wish, but it doesn't have to be. There are so many other ways, helping children, helping animals. I mean, they're just a countless way. Do not try to go through this thing by yourself. Find a way to give back. That's the way to help, if you wish. Uh, being in a community, having your talents used, and you, you've learned some amazing things, <laughs> some of which will be legal in, in this country. You've learned some amazing things. You can practice most of them here. Um, so under those conditions, that, that's what I say can take. And, and Sharon, you have reminded me uh, that I need to renew my commitment to my fellow vets, that, uh, that you're, you, we shouldn't leave you out there in the foxhole by yourself either. You're dealing with some, some heavy stuff too. So I'm going to tie into you more and see what I could do um, to speak to folk and to, you know, to, to see if Steve Epps can stay up all night, then I can stay up half of the night. So under those, <laughs> he's a better man than me by far, but still, uh, I can do my part. Uh, and we will get to our Afghan brothers and sisters who are, uh, who don't know the language, don't know the culture. Suddenly they find themselves in a big, hangar at Kennedy Airport, and that's where they're going to be stationed. It's a giant hangar. I've been in it before. Uh, a, a couple of football, two or three football fields, and it's that big, and, and how they're going to make home there for several weeks, I have no idea, but I think that they should be greeted, and I think that uh, we should start dialoguing with them, and uh, they stood with us we will stand with them, but we will also stand with the veterans that come in. And every chance we get, when we speak to the higher ups, when I speak to the higher ups, uh, God willing, I will have the, the pleasure of speaking to a very good man, our president. Uh, and if I get the, uh, the chance to pull him to the side or as close to the side as I can do, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, sir, I, I, I do not envy the weight that you have on your shoulder, the, the decisions that, you're right, uh, Ms., Mr. Bentley, 
as a politician, you're not gonna you're not gonna please everybody. The best thing you can do is throw that away. Get that out of your mind of pleasing everybody. And just focus on doing right or whatever you believe is your best with the best knowledge and what's right and live with the rest. And I would tell that to the president. I will say to him, sir, um, we need to do both. We need to do diplomatic, but at the same time, we need to have some co covert stuff because they're not going to let some of these guys out. Uh, we have left some such high value that from their point of view, they would be stupid to let these guys out. Uh, they will have to make a public display of them. And uh, the longer that they're there, the more that they are in danger, the more that, I mean, they, we only got weeks to months to get the, to move these people. Uh, many of them, we can do it di diplomatically, uh, but some of the folk who have worked on these Blackhawks and, and other stuff, or some of the work, folk who have worked with SEAL teams and other teams, um, you know, they're, they're, they're just not going to let these guys walk. Uh, we're going to have to yeah, dip, be diplomatic, but at the same time, you're going to have to send some folk in, and we're going to have to get some folk because we have a sacred duty. Let's not Let's not do to them what we did to the Kurds uh, and to others. Let's not, let's not get into a, a, an American pattern of that. Um, that's not our pattern. Uh, we can argue here all day long, but that is not our pattern of leaving anybody on the battlefield. Not simply American troops, but everybody who says that they're gonna fire the same way uh, that uh, that that we're going to do this together, then they got a right, and uh, and I believe that the American people will go for that too. I believe that um, that we should be as real, and I pray to God that that Biden, President Biden, and his people are be having real conversations about extractions, and that's what you're talking about. How are we going to do covert extractions? of some of these folk uh, because they, the clock is ticking. I don't care how good they are in, in going to ground. Um, they got days to weeks. Uh, you could go to ground, but if you got your family with you, you, you they got days to weeks and we got to figure something out. And we got to have a little bit of everything. A lot of this di diplomacy business. We are not, we have a lot of cards di diplomatically. Uh, these guys need food. They need to run a whole government. They got all kinds of stuff that now, now that you fought and you won, now you got to run this thing. Now you got to make the whole thing run. Now they have an advantage because I believe that they want to go back to the 18th century. So, you know, it does not take much uh, to have uh, a Pol Pot, a, a Cambodia type, let's, the immigrant or whatever we want to call it. But at the same, anyway, I'm ranting now, my friends, obviously I'm in the wrong lane. These guys have inspired me. And, and, and all of them have inspired me and I'm, I'm way above, way above my pay grade. I'm trying to hang with these guys. Give me, give me a moment. I mean, you know, it's, hey, it's my show. Ah, <laughs> it's your own show. My friends, thank you very much for this. I have truly enjoyed it. I will be speaking with you, uh, Miss Lindsay, soon. Gentlemen, if I can be useful yeah. to you in your journey, uh, I am in your debt. Uh, and you know how we feel about being in debt. We love to pay our debts one way or another. <laughs> Having said that, my friends, uh, for the rest of us, please listen to the show. And, and if you really want to do anything for any of these folks, grab one of these bets. Grab somebody who, who you know, you don't, you don't have to understand what they've been through. You just have to be willing and open and say, okay, let's talk. That's all you have to do. That's your first step. Having said that, go with God, everyone. 
God bless you all. God bless America. Let's see this thing through. Thank you, Senator. God bless you. Thank you, okay. Senator. All right. Take care all. <laughs>